proposal was accepted by the Denver Art Museum uh, to have 12 trees standing up that might kind of represent kind of a calendar form medicine wheel and went up to, and visited the medicine wheel in Wyoming a couple of times. But I've decided to make my uh, circle have only 10 trees rather than 12 that represent the months of the year. So we're not really creating a, an actual religious uh, uh, icon. You know, we're making art, we're making a modern sculpture. And then this, the trees are in my paintings, you know, the trees, the juniper trees on the prairie of Oklahoma have been in my paintings, continue to be part of that language I, I look at. On the prairie, uh, the small trees we do have are remarkable because the prairie is treeless, really, you know, so when you find the, the, the small forest, you're always thankful. Those kind of shapes became an archetypal form for me, and, I, and it crept into my work although it was subliminal. I didn't know that I was doing that. I was here um, as a little boy on this land and discovered how to live. I, I became a hunter. I had a big garden. I'd give potatoes away to everybody. You know, so I, I, we learned how to live that way. And then my paintings certainly, you know, came from this land. And like there's a rock right here. You know, there's this cut rock right in this area from hunters from over a thousand years ago would hike up the same canyon and they would stop and rest and they would make flint uh, while they were here waiting. And, um, and I had a real uh, uh, revelation in a sense in this spot because I was considering how to fight for Native American rights and how to make art in a political vein and what would be the weapon uh, of choice today. And I was struck by how sharp these stones still are, even if they were cut a thousand years ago and left here. And, um, and I found that actual art would be the weapon to use today, you know, to, to fight for Native people. Um, so it gave me a whole perspective on political art uh, from sitting right here and hunting and having my gun in my hand. but knowing that a gun can't really safely propel me, but I can make art uh, in a very uh, proactive way and, and be as sharp as these stones that are here. So. I really uh, feel strongly about presenting this uh, natural tree form that grows with a fork in it in a natural way, and you know that if you cut the tree in a fork form, you have a very strong place to support anything that you want to support. So conceptually for me, uh, the, the wheel being ten standing trees with fork poles uh, will exist as a support for all the endeavors of Native people. Well, I think that when Edgar approaches the idea of tree and the forks that happen in trees, I, for me, what I see in my own personal experience of trees is that they, they represent not only an existence over time, but they also represent an existence of, of one's life cycle. In the fall, as the leaves begin to change color and, and the tree returns to its singular shape and form, that in a real sense represents a life cycle. It really does move from one physical state to another, um, which affects the emotional and psychological state of the individual. And, Again, in a sense, are really reborn. So that's how I see the tree. For the, for the sculpture wheel, we have you know, full-scale standing trees that are 12 feet tall. And they're made of wood, and they're covered with rag paper. And then I do the diagramming of all the, the editorial on the outside. You know, we, and I've, I've established these uh, over like a two, three-year period. So. 
Um, but it's been really, really effective for me to have that in the studio, to look at them and to move them around and turn them and have them relate to each other as they will in a circle. The intention of the piece was to, uh, I guess, firstly represent Native people in Colorado, represent Native people, I guess, in America could be another idea, uh, and to look at history in a more open way, uh, more factual way, maybe, even with an editorial from me as a Shine Rappel person, but to try to uh, expand the knowledge base that we all have about the history of Native people, particularly in Colorado, which is a very uh, explosive, kind of inflammatory location in, in the world for Native people. And uh, starts in 1833. Tribes are still recovering from the massacres and from losing their land, their hunting, their leadership. Um, the massacre at Sun Creek and later the massacre at Washita in Oklahoma Indian Territory led to the Shine Rappo uh, tribal leader, particularly Shine leaders, being taken as hostages and put in prison in Florida. And uh, my family was very heavily impacted by Fort Mary. And my, my, my father, uh, Charles Heap of Birds, uh, his father, Guy Heap of Birds, his father, Black Wolf Heap of Birds, then his father, uh, many magpies, Chief Many Magpies, he was in prison in Fort Marion. And actually my name, Hockeyavy, Little Chief, uh, the first man that had that name was also in Fort Marion. He was in, in prison after the Washita Massacre. So all that kind of comes down to me. And uh, so in a sense, I feel like I have this ownership on one level of uh, some of the artwork that was done in prison by my relatives. So I've been using those images from Fort Marion kind of from my family, and then the magpie is actually from a drawing that was done in prison too. And then my name, Heap of Birds, was translated first as many magpies, and that goes into the, the final tree that has all the magpies flying. And I bring it back out because they were the best people to observe that transition and that kind of crushing pressure of the uh, colonial power in America on the Cheyenne Nation. So it has kind of two major roles in that it's a modern art piece, but it's, it'll have a pretty captivating formal element being 10 standing 12 foot trees in a circle. And you'll see that from far away. But I think the next element with the piece is the extensive research and history that's evident um, being presented in the piece. So you can actually sit and read the sculpture you know, probably for hours and, and try to understand the history. Edgar is, is reminding us of our histories, what, how we came to be where we are now. But at the same time, he's also saying, we don't want to repeat history. When you repeat history, you're in the same place. You no longer have grown. And what he's saying is that this, that this particular contemporary society has grown to the point where we need to begin to actively be uh, involved with each other because our survival is really dependent upon that as, as human beings. We also wanted a piece that was very intellectually uh, appropriate for the site here in Denver, in Colorado. We knew that he looked at American policy and American history vis-a-vis -vis Indian people from a very totally different perspective than what most people had uh, viewed in the past. Well, I think that the work is really, from my standpoint, is effective because it may appear to be confrontational from the very beginning but on the other hand you know when we begin to look into the the, the levels of the work we i think will arrive at a greater understanding of what the artist is talking about the artist is really talking about in in a real sense the building of a particular kind of community our job as a viewer is to go and say, what is the artist talking about? What is he saying? It's incumbent upon the viewer to become involved and say, is there something in here that is that I can learn from?
or about? The, the, tree, you know, the sculpture is very complex in, in, in many good ways that every tree has a theme, you know, so there was a broad uh, thematic sketch for, in 10 pieces. But every time I got to a tree, I built, and I built the trees separately. Each one was a, was a separate kind of activity and I would draw on the outside of the model and so on. And I guess what the artist is always trying to do is to find, find like the value or the, the constant or the, the methodology in a, in a form or a process and, and it takes a while to do that. And that's why the trees for the Denver Art Museum have been sitting in the studio for four years and I'm trying to find that rhythm of those forms so I can actually express myself through those things. Um, but there was enough time over like the five or six years that I could interject new ideas I had, you know, about culture and history in the, the next tree. And it, and it wasn't in a, in, a, in a chronological order. I just jumped around with the themes I felt strongest about. I finish one tree and move on to the next one. Uh, so I was able to interject a lot of new ideas too. But I'm, I'm, as an artist, I'm very uh, diverse in my approach. You know, I'm making paintings that are abstract and kind of celebratory. I'm making diaristic drawings about love. I'm making lip mono, monotypes about relationships, prints. Uh, you know, I'm doing, uh, I'm writing essays, I'm teaching. He probably had it going on in his mind. So. Um, these are all phrases that I've been working on and um, just kind of part of the diary kind of thing. So these are all um, kind of descriptions of events or people or uh, I guess incidences lately. And then I come, I come in the studio and write them down, and I pin them up, and and I kind of think about, reflect on, on what this was, what these things were, and, and I think your life has to be um, available to you, or you need to have some kind of existence that you can reflect upon to make art. And if you can't reflect on your life, you can't make any art. You know, so. So what is this place here? This is the north family uh, allotment, whether it's good or bad, you know, if you have things you can, that are remarkable, you can make art out of that. And so they're all Arapaho people um, from 1860 or so. And uh, my mother's Arapaho, so it's her, her family. Well, her mother was Nora North. So they're all buried here, all the Norths. But you have, uh, you know, your own thoughts, your own experiences. You log them in, you might have a notebook or scrap piece of paper, a napkin, and you write some couple of words down and then kind of hold them with you. Um, and then I come in and I would put them on the wall. So I really, I really appreciate the, the structure of the drawings and how language can become a structure, uh, a structure in your mind, a memory, um, an expression, but also a picture. For me, text is another element, like a design element. Um, and just in the physical shape of it, too, you know. It's almost like when a poet uses words because of how they sound. They may not even use them for the meaning. They may just like the sound of a, of a phrase. And so I do that all the time, too. I pick a word because I like the sound that makes in my ear. Um, so there's sort of a texture behind language, a shape, a weight, you know, a speed of language, too. I mean, color has speed, too. There's like yellow is really fast. And, White's real fast and brown's slow. And so an artist will know uh, how to handle all those elements. And so a lot of the text I use is just from kind of almost a formal way of handling it, too. Edgar had done this piece. Um, on the Indian massacre, and it was like this text, and you know, like sort of inverting some of the letters. And it, when I saw it on the wall, it, it sort of reminded me of concrete poetry and sort of tone poems. And there was something about the inversion of the letter then, that made you think about what the sound of the word was, and then what the sound of the word would be if you inverted it, and also 
the way that you could um, encode meaning in the most basic way just by flipping things over. Because people tend to come to an art gallery and even if it's a piece just made up of letters, they'll relate to the color and they'll relate to the design. And they probably wouldn't even pay all that much attention to what was being said. But there was a way Edgar grabbed you. There was no way you could avoid it because he used different colors in the lettering. And the language was so simple. It was like haiku, you know, in, in that sense. Uh, and, you know, as I got to know him and um, got to know a lot about, you know, much more about you know, various Native American cultures, I realized it was something very, the economy was also about the way, the, you know, that the language would have been in the kind of rhythm, the, the staccato rhythm that you would have in the language. I've sort of, I guess, just by happenstance established a methodology to uh, distill, um, I guess, big emotions into three words or, so anyway, um, I discussed that in the tree, in the sculpture, but it, it comes into three, three or four words. Uh, a good artist, in a sense, works with everything in the same way, you know, whether it's a sound or a shape or a color, uh, a letter, you know, the weight of a sculpture, the height of a sculpture. Words are a physical manifestation in terms of the letters, you know, they, they're, they're, they're like a sculptural element or a color. Edgar rose to the occasion from the moment we begin to see his concepts of what this monument could be, and he has realized it, I think, in the most dramatic and dynamic way, both as a formal work of art and the tin totems that create this medicine wheel and the uh, language that is written on it that really engages the visitor. And then as you move through those tin totems and you begin to look at the writing, the graffiti that's on them, you are reminded of so many incidences or facts in the history of Native American communities and the struggles that they have had uh, since the arrival of European settlers. Edgar has created a great work of art, but he's also created a very engaging piece of sculpture, which I think fits all the criteria of being an outstanding piece of public art. I think public art has a, a responsibility to address the public. You know, it's not, my studio art is more personal. You know, my drawings are like poems uh, or graffiti messages. My paintings are like trees and water and fish, but more abstract. So um, those are more personal and kind of more closed in the sense of being just about me and my vision. Whereas this sculpture is, ha, adheres much more to a broad community. You know, beginning with like Anasazi, you know, very old uh, traditional life, uh, cliff dwellings, petroglyphs, and then coming up to Ute Nation, Cheyenne Rappel Nation, Wounded Knee, uh, massacres that happened in this area of the world. So the whole scope of the work uh, is very inclusive of many peoples. And it's not just my, my story. Then he also, in bringing all of his understanding of Native American culture and some of the major issues relating to Native American culture, he took that site, made it his own, and really the sculpture and the site then become one as he has married so many traditional aspects of the medicine wheel, summer solstice, and all of those issues into a very dramatic way. Started out, you know, um, the project wheel was actually standing tablets where it had language on either side, native language and English language kind of duality. And then I was there doing a site visit in Denver and actually found a tree in the front of their uh, museum area about two in the morning and it was a big tree with a big fork in it and then that was the moment that I sort of realized we should make like 10 or 12 trees rather than have them be kind of postmodernist uh, tablets standing up. We should have them be more uh, natural. But to have say 12 of those that might kind of um, represent kind of a calendar form, medicine wheel, uh, that kind of remembrance of the seasons and the cycle of life and went up to, and visited the Medicine Wheel in Wyoming a couple of times. 
Uh, and so we've come to this uh, realization of, of creating 10 trees, you know, which was another uh, evolution of the project. It was based on the medicine wheel and some current ceremonial practice uh, in the Cheyenne Nation. But I've decided to make my uh, circle have only 10 trees rather than 12 that represent the months of the year. So we're not really creating a, an actual religious uh, uh, icon or, or, or tool instrument. You know, we're making art, we're making a modern sculpture. The wheel is, is a very significant piece and I think it belongs here in Denver, mainly because it's at the foothills of, of the mountains. And the mountains have always been thought of as, as very important to the culture of, of the Native American. Many of the people on the plains and in the Southwest always went to the mountains because there was felt that these are sacred sites in the sense that this is where they were able to not only ascend, but to recreate themselves in a real positive sense. It allowed them to become who they were and reinforced who they, who they are and who they were to become. Edgar is an artist of international recognition today. Um, he works throughout the world um, and uh, while he certainly has roots here and is Native American, Edgar is addressing issues that really are broader in terms of, of the humanities and issues that relate to mankind on a universal level. And I think that is what makes Edgar the appropriate artist to have done this, but also Edgar as a major uh, contemporary artist. And, uh, while they are very specific to Native Americans in some ways, but this is a piece of sculpture with a message uh, that is far broader than simply being tied to one culture, one place. And it was part of the initial theme was to create it as a, in a way, a component you know, that the trees are standing and the trees are there in the locations of the wheel in Wyoming, but they're there to metaphorically support activities of, of people to come uh, uh, after I'm gone or, you know, adjacent to my life, other people's lives. They're there to support other people's lives. And I, I really like that and seeing the piece now finished, I mean, it's one of the strongest parts of it is that it's a component for other people to engage and interact with, you know, what they do with it. Uh, and it also hints at something to come to me. It seems like something's gonna happen. It's not a, like a solidly closed figure dropped from the sky. It, it's uh, open-ended, uh, literally. And then ultimately, of course, it makes a, a circular form that's very affirming. My parents came to visit the sculpture and when it was a model, 12 foot tall. And one of the things it did, it kind of cradled people. And people wanted to sit in the middle of it and just talk and visit. And it seemed to be kind of a safe space or a, a humbly kind of a cradling space. And that was just from the model. And, and I think that happens here now, too, when you walk into the circle. It's kind of a, maybe a healing sensibility, um, something that reaffirms you. Uh, and I think that's, that's going to be an overriding uh, experience. I'm thankful for this beautiful day. You know, early this morning, uh, across this country, perhaps across the world, many cultures observed this solstice. Some were educational forms, and others were probably private ceremonies. Edgar has been in the forefront of opening up the debate on contemporary cultural affairs. So I hope for that, Edgar. It's essential to think about how one is living. 
And art is just one way of doing that thinking. I think your life has to be um, available to you or you need to have some kind of existence that you can reflect upon to make art. And if you can't reflect on your life, you can't make any art. Whether it's good or bad, you know, if you have things you can, that are remarkable, you can make art out of that.